That's the nicest way I can say to sit down. We're not. I can yell louder. It's all right. I am known in the office as the office jerk because I just say what, what we need to do, so I don't care about feelings. Um, same at home. Good morning. There we go. That's better. I am not Andrew. Andrew comes across real nice and pleasant, and then there's me. All right. So um, let's start with greetings, birthdays, and an anniversary. So any birthdays or anniversaries? Everybody sitting on their hands. Any takers? Going once? Going twice? All right. All right. So, no, there's no birthdays or anniversaries. So let's start with praises. Since we haven't started yet, start with praises. Anybody have a praise for the week? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. We'll be, we will be praying. All right. Anybody else? Praise, prayer requests? Open the floor. Yes? On the 15th, okay. We'll be praying for them. Him, sorry. All right. Yes, sir. Wow. I know Pastor mentioned that a couple weeks ago. Just know of quite a few churches that don't have pastors right now. And uh, not only is it tough. Um, to keep a church together, it's tough to keep the direction. And, um, you know, Satan gets in there and starts causing all kinds of problems among members that used to get along just fine. And now that there's not a leader, an under-shepherd, um, Satan just jumps on that. So we need to pray for these churches. All right, anybody else? John said I only had 36 seconds, so yes, sir. Amen. Then bless us with a sweet um, pastor and his wife and kids. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, so thankful for the many blessings. Amen. Yes. All right. Anybody else? I'm not trying to cut it short. I was just blaming John because it's fun to do. Because he told me to start early. All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's put the verse up real quick. This is the first week of this. First week I've ever done this. So, you know, um, Andrew always comes up with these great eloquent 
um, synopsis of the chapter. So I'm reading it going, uh, this is the Bible, right? No, just kidding. Now, actually, the, the, the first part of uh, Psalm 36, um, it's really talking about man and his evil devices. And this is sort of the, the, the verse that changes the entire chapter. And it goes from man and his evil devices to thy mercy. And then the rest of the chapter just goes through um, the attributes of God, his loving kindness, his excellent mercy. It just takes a, a turn that once you take hold of the mercy of God and give yourself to him, he will take over. And if we're left to our own devices, you end up in a bunch of trouble because obviously we're not supposed to be there. So um, let's, let's start with um, reference verse reference. So Psalm 36.5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches unto the clouds. Psalm 36, 5. So definitely a verse that, um, you know, we, we talk about Brother Eric with all these praises. You know, you see the mercy of God in our lives on a daily basis. And um, we just definitely need to be thankful for what God has done in our lives. So let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in your house, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, for your mercy and your loving kindness and your generosity to us on a daily basis, Lord. And I don't think we will fully understand what you've done for us until we get to heaven, Lord, not only through salvation, Lord, but just the day-to-day graces and mercies and everything you supply to us, Lord, that we don't even comprehend and never will be able to comprehend, Lord. But, Lord, you love us. You gave yourself for us, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for the praises of the day. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for the health you've given people in this room, Lord, from recoveries, Lord. I want to I pray, thank you, Lord, for, again, your hand of blessing on this church, Lord, uh, what you've done here and what you're going to do. Lord, I pray for the ones, Lord, who are, are dealing with sicknesses, Lord, and dealing with issues in their lives, Lord, that are, that are just trying, Lord. I pray that you just be with them, Lord. Give them mercy. Give them grace, Lord, to... Uh, draw them closer to you, Lord. Give the doctors wisdom. Uh, give them peace to pass us all understanding, Lord, as they go through these trials and tribulations, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll just uh, use this as, as a time for growth in their lives, Lord. Touch them. Be with them, Lord. Thank you for all you've done, Lord. Pray that you just be with uh, the, the service to follow, Lord. Pray to help our hearts to be open and attentive to your word. Thank you for all you've done, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So you start a minute early, and there's no birthdays or um, anniversaries, huh? <laughs> so we're in good shape. Today's uh, missionary spotlight is on the Polanco family, our missionaries to the Dominican Republic, Jeffrey and Pamela. Their sending church is Woodland Baptist Church in Maryland, and their mission board, like many of our other missionaries, is BIMI. So the Dominican Republic shares the island of Hispanola, with Haiti to the west. It's only one of five islands shared by two independent nation states. With 11 million people, it's the most populous island in the West Indies. It's also the second largest land area in the West Indies after Cuba. It's about two times the size of uh, New Hampshire, and the Polancos live in uh, Nagua. Now, if you look at the right there on the bottom, uh, San Domi Santo Domingo, if you go straight north up to the coast, you'll see Nagua, that's where they live. The official language in the Dominican Republic is Spanish. Its terrain comprises rainforests, savannas, and highlands. Pico Duarte is the tallest mountain in the Caribbean at over 10,000 feet. Its economy is considered an upper middle class developing country with mining, tourism, manufacturing, energy, and agriculture. If you're a baseball fan like me, they won the World Baseball Classic in 2013, only one of three countries to do that. And for such a small population, uh, they've, they are very well known for their baseball players. All right, let's take a look at the Dominican Republic flag. In the center is a large cross. Uh, the white represents salvation. The red represents the blood of independence. And the blue for liberty. If you look at the banner, which is blown up on the bottom there, uh, you see Dios, Patria, Libertad, which means God, Fatherland, and Liberty. If you look at the shield, it depicts a cross and a Bible. 
The Bible is open to John 8.32, which says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I think it's the only flag in the world that has a Bible on it. Following both the French and Spanish rule, from as early as the 16th century, the Dominican Republic declared its independence from Haiti in 1844. In 1866, it reverted to Spanish rule, and then finally got its independence in 1865, which was 159 years ago. Let's look at the religions of the Dominican Republic. The Constitution says it provides freedom of religion. However, the Dominican Republic has a concordant with the Holy See, which is the government of the Catholic Church. This designates the Roman Catholicism as the official state religion, uh, which extends special privileges to the church. 57% are Catholic, 23% Protestant, mostly Lutheran, 18% atheist. And considering, you know, the Bible on the flag, John 8:32, that truth shall set you free. So truth still needs to be preached in the Dominican Republic. All right, who is Jeffrey Polanco? He was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. At 10 years old, he moved to the USA. As a child, Jeffrey was introduced to different charismatic churches, and he said, quote, made a promise that he would never go to church again. At age 13, he was introduced to a high school baseball team. You can see on the right, High Point High School in Beltsville, Maryland. At Jeffrey's first baseball practice, he heard a clear presentation of the gospel and accepted Christ as his savior. He began to attend church faithfully, and God's word transformed his life. Jeffrey met his wife, Pamela, on a mission trip in the Dominican Republic in 2013, and were married in May of 2016, eight years ago. They moved to Noagua the following year and planted North Coast Baptist Church the following year, 2018. And you can see a picture of the church there. Pamela was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. Pamela's family never had any religious practices. She said it had a very atheistic influence in her life. Pamela was saved and is a product of Ecclesia Batista El Faro, which is a church planted by a BIMI missionary. Ever since Pamela was saved, she told herself, if someone was willing to leave all that he possessed in America to come to my country to win, to win the loss to Christ, the least I can do is likewise. There's a big praise in the Polanco family. They're expecting their first child. After seven years of longing, they're thrilled that their prayers for a baby has been answered and their little miracle is expected in July. Pam was on medical bed rest since late November, but since mid-January, she's been taken off full bed rest, but she's limited to what she can do. North Coast Baptist had a recent Christmas dinner. The event was filled with gratitude and testimonies, and it's the first time the entire church was actively participating. Jeffrey and Pam were presented with a surprise honor plaque. If you look on the bottom there, the gentleman next to um, Jeffrey is Brother Jose, one of the church leaders, giving them the plaque. Um, the Polancos started church planting early in their lives, I think when Jeffrey was only 23 years old. So his, one of his favorite verses is 1 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth, but be an example of the believers. North Coast Baptist 2024 goals uh, included evangelism campaign during January, uh, daily sharing the gospel of our wonderful Savior. It started right after New Year's on January 2nd, where they went in the streets of Nagua and where the church bus van picks up. Uh, we're told that they already have seen increases in attendance and in souls professing faith in Christ. The next focus was to go into the schools. I, if you remember when he was here, schools are not shut down, and they're actually open to, um, to um, preaching. So in January 25th, as of that date, they had already been to one private and one public school, 
Uh, and many made professions of faith, some interested in coming to church. In the last week of January, which I don't have any updates on yet, they were planning on going into two more schools. They gave out tons of Romans and gospel tracts. Continuing with their 2024 goals, they're looking forward to starting a Bible, st Bible studies in the small town of Mata Bonita, which is about 45 minutes from Nagua. And that's starting this month. Uh, there's no gospel preaching church in that town. If the Lord permits, their goal is to establish a church there later this year. Bible studies being the, the first initiative of that. Uh, Brother Dario, who grew up in that town, and he's starting missionary training, is preparing to become the pastor of this new church, if it's the Lord's will. And not to be limited to just Nagua and Mata Bonita, Brother Jose, who you saw in the picture earlier with Jeffrey, uh, we'll be training. We'll be starting another Bible study in the town of Samana. I think he grew up in Samana, uh, on the peninsula east of Na Nagua. It's only 35 miles as the bird bird flies. Looks like a beautiful area there. Uh, again, to preach the gospel. All right. If you want to pray for the Polancos, um, first of a praise was that they did raise the hundred fifty thousand dollars needed for their new church building and. Uh, they need to complete the, the church um, purchase process. Obviously, we want to pray for baby Polanco and Pam, their soul-winning campaign, and the ministries in Mata Bonita and Samana. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for how bold Jeffrey and Pam were saved and how you changed their lives, Lord, and called them to missionary work. Uh, we pray that your hand and favor would remain on them, Lord, this year, uh, that Pam would remain healthy, they'd have a healthy baby, Lord, and that, their, um, that, that your gospel would be out, get out in these various towns. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this on? We're good? Yeah, sure, that's great. <clears throat> Brother, I appreciate the humility, but you don't have to lie. We all know that you're better at this than I am. Sometimes I wonder why you all let me up here, um, especially with announcements. I'll say things, and then I'll get done. I'll be like, is he going to let me back? Maybe that's why we did it at night now when you leave, or afterwards, right? You can get out and don't have to hear. John chapter 8. It really is a, a humbling honor to be able to speak to all of you today. Um, it's amazing because God always gives me something. I love it. He just, I don't have to worry about it at this point. He just gives you something to speak on. And I know that there's perhaps somebody in here I could be a blessing to, and that's a huge encouragement. So John chapter 8, and um, the theme that we're going to be talking about is to motivate Christians who are stalled or sidelined by the anchors of sin, inadequacy, or rejection. So are you letting your past swallow your future? Or are you letting your present swallow your future? And I'll start with a little bit of an analogy or an example. I was in high school, and basketball examples are good, right? Uh, we played for a basketball team. We were by no means good. Um, we had a reputation of being the opposite of that. So uh, we had a winning season one year, and it was, it was awesome, right, winning season. And I was the point guard, and so you bring the ball down, and uh, I loved it. It was a great position to be in. And this one year, we, we got pretty far. And uh, the next day, this was a Friday night, and Saturday we had a tournament. And uh, we, we don't ever get to this tournament. We're getting to the tournament. And on Friday night, we played a team that shockingly was worse than us. Uh, it's, trust me, it, that's shocking. So they were not as great as we were. We were ahead. We were doing great. It was awesome. And it got to the point where I was just doing it for me. I was trying to get my stats up, uh, which weren't very high to begin with. And uh, I should have not have been playing, to be honest. I should have just, but the coach let me. And there was an inbound pass. And it was to me. It was directed to me. And I was kind of on the move. So I jumped up to get it. Uh, one of our forwards was there as well, or at least behind me. I didn't see him. And he uh, jumped up for the ball as well. We came down. I came down on his foot, twisted the ankle, instantly popped up, you know, like not open. It was just blew up, right? Uh, and so I was sidelined. And we finished the game. Of course, we won that game. Then the next day, I went to the tournament, but I was assisted with crutches. I had to sit on the sidelines. 
So I couldn't play. I was supposed to play. I had a job to do, and I couldn't do it because I had this anchor of injury. And I want to talk today about the anchors of sin. We have a job to do. We all have a job to do. And I don't know if you're like me, but I know for me, if you're not saved, you're not in the game. But if you're saved, there's been times where I was in sin, and that anchored me down. I couldn't move forward. And it might not be sin for you. Maybe it's this feeling of inadequacy. I want to hit on that today, too. You just don't feel adequate enough to do the job that God has for you to do. So I want to read this passage. It's about uh, the adulterous woman would be the the, um, heading if you have headings in your Bible. The adulterous woman. And um, I want to look at it from her perspective. She wasn't in the game. You'll see that. And then what Jesus tells her, I think, is something that's applicable to all of us that we can all take uh, part of. Before we read it, though, if, you, if you've heard me speak before, I like to give background. And so I'll, I'll be fair, though, uh, in chapter 7 and chapter 8, there are some commentators who think that chapter 8 doesn't belong there. They might not know where it belongs, but it seems to flow, and this is where my Bible has it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that this is the chronology of events. So in chapter 7, Jesus, in the beginning, is in Galilee. He's not in Judea because the Jews wanted to kill him, and his time was not yet. This is probably about six months before the crucifixion. He's in Galilee. They're going to have this Feast of Tabernacle in Judea or in Jerusalem, which is about 80 miles away. His brethren say, let's go up to to Judea. Let's go up to Jerusalem to this Feast of Tabernacles, which was a six-day kind of event where the priests would walk every day into the temple, and they would have this water. They'd bring it in the seventh day. They wouldn't carry the water in. You'll see later that Jesus stands up on the seventh day and says, if you're thirsty for spiritual drink, come drink here, right? But at the time, he's in Galilee. He doesn't want to go up. The brother, his brethren and say, come on up. He says, it's not my time. And the background's important because when we step into this woman's shoes, you'll see why it's important because what the world and the pressures of the world and the devil, what they, what they bring on us. So he's in Galilee. Brothers say, come up. He says, no, not yet. They leave. Then he goes up. He travels up to, um, uh, to Judea, to Jerusalem. When he's getting there, he's probably on his way, I imagine. But when his brethren were there and the Jews don't see him, they start murmuring among themselves, where is he? They're looking for him. Where is this guy? Well, he finally gets there about the middle of the feast, and he goes to the temple and he starts teaching. And some people are confused. They're just, and Jesus is not quiet about it. He's the Christ. He wants you to know that. He's the Christ. And some people don't believe him. Some do believe him. Some say, well, hold on a second. You're from Galilee. What, who comes from Galilee? There's, Christ doesn't come from Galilee. Later, you'll find out that the Pharisees actually say to Nicodemus to silence him. Nicodemus raises the point. He's like, why don't we hear what he has to say? They go, no, are you from Galilee? Nothing comes from Galilee. Do your homework. We're not going to hear him. Well, if they did do their homework, they'd realize that he was born in Bethlehem. Okay? But they didn't care to do that. So he's finally, he's in Jerusalem, he's at the t- Feast of Tabernacles, and he's, and he's speaking. The Pharisees send officers, or send people, officers, to go arrest him, to take him. They hate Jesus. They hate him. The officer's goal was to go and to get him. And they get there, and they start listening to him, and they're like, man, no one speaks like this guy. So they don't take him. They go back to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, what are you doing? Why didn't you come with him? No one spoke like this man. They go, are you deceived too? Have any of us believed in him? Trust us. We're the religious leaders. Trust us. Nicodemus at that time says, why would we do that? We, our law says we need to hear him out. Give him a fair hearing. They say, no, no, no. No. Nothing comes out of Galilee. Listen to us. So let's go to chapter 7, verse 30, uh, 53. This, this just happened. They tried, the Pharisees want to get Jesus. They're really mad at what he's doing. He's in the Feast of the Tabernacle. This is supposed to be the Pharisees event. And they sent officers, the officers came back empty-handed. And then it says in 53, and every man, the Pharisees included, every man went unto his own house. Verse 1 of chapter 8, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. So just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the next few verses. I'm going to pause a few times and, and just talk about it. But they all go to their houses. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. I won't emphasize what the Bible doesn't emphasize, but you have to wonder what. He's, he's 80 miles away from Galilee. He goes about a mile outside of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, I imagine, just knowing the character of Jesus, that he's probably praying, gets some rest. He has to leave Jerusalem. People want to kill him. Um, So he's he's out at the Mount of Olives, okay? Everyone else goes to their own home. Verse 2, and early in the morning, he came again into the temple. Again, the backdrop here, they hate him. They want to kill him. It's important. You'll see why that's important. 
And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And they had set her in the midst. When they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Can I pause there for a second? Can you imagine? It's almost like a tattletale. Oh, he, I got him. I, she's, she was taking adultery, the very act, the, the very thing, okay? Jesus. Now, keep, they're still talking. Let's, let's keep going. Verse 5, they're still talking. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Stop right there. They brought this woman. Who knows whether they went the night before and, and orchestrated this. We'll talk about that in a second. But they bring this woman. They set her in the midst. And they already, the background, we know that they already hated him. They already wanted to take him. They already, and the Bible tells us right here, they're doing this to tempt him. Jesus, this woman was taken in adultery. This is perfect. This is a yes or no, Jesus. And I got you either way. Whoever thought of this scheme, they are going to get a promotion. If you say they need to be stoned, you're cruel, you're going to lose your following. If you, and also, you're probably breaking Roman law because they had taken away, the Romans took away the right to execute for religious reasons. So he's in trouble that way. If he says no, he's in trouble now because guess what? He's saying, no, Moses' law is of no good. You, you can't, uh, I'm just going to disobey that. They got him, Right? They tried to box him in. Let's see what Jesus does here, though. Verse, um, verse 6, midway down. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, pause again, he's as if he didn't hear him. He stoops down. And he's almost in this prone position like the Pharisees then get over him. And you see, they continue to ask him, hey, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus, did you hear us? She's taking, what are you going to do? Moses says that she, I'm not saying she should be stoned. I'm seeing what you should say. Jesus, what are you going to do? They got him, and they're, they're hammering it home. What's this woman thinking? She's in the midst. She knows the penalty. She knows that it's very possible she's going to die because of her sin, not just any death. She's going to die by stoning. It's a very painful death. So what is she thinking? Jesus is stooping down. Let's keep reading. So when they, verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So how awesome is this? Your accusers are coming to Jesus. We'll, we'll, we'll develop this more, but your accusers come to Jesus and he just stoops down. They're still accusing he didn't stay stoop and look up and say, uh, who, whoever uh, doesn't have any sin, you go ahead and stone first. No, no, he stood up, got to eye level. That's, if I can say it, that's a power move. He stood up and he said, hey, who of you don't have sin, cast the first stone, and then he gets back down. He didn't stare them down after he got back down. This is the character of Jesus. This is the power that he has. This is outside the box. This really threw them off. These are, this is what I want us to think about, the same Jesus who, who confronts our accusers. So let's just keep going. Verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. i got to stop there. I love all of Scripture. But this phrase in here is probably one of my most favorite. When you put yourself in her shoes for this phrase, it is very dramatic. Let me read this again. Verse 9, the end of it. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Can you picture yourself? You got your accusers, the weight of the world. And there's a point where all of that drowns out. And it's you and Jesus. We'll develop that more, but I just had to point that out. That's one of my most favorite, sweetest parts of Scripture. Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself... And saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. There's a lot to unpack here, but let's back this up. We're going to finally put ourselves into the woman's shoes. Knowing the background here is important for this first point. The world, again, bring this home, 
if you are in a position where you feel the weight of your own sin or the weight of inadequacy, we'll talk about it at the end here, but maybe are you in a position now where you can be, uh, where you can give advice, spiritual advice to someone and help them grow? Or are you in the position where you say, I- I'm not there. I- I'm not good enough to help someone else. We have the discipleship program going on. Are you in a position where you say, I want to be that person that can disciple someone? Or are you in a position where you go, I kind of need to be the one that is discipled? It's fine to be there. But if you are afraid because of inadequacy, let's, let, this is for you. Okay, This is how you get to the place where you can go, yeah, I'm inadequate, but Jesus is adequate, and he can strengthen me. So that's where we're going to get. All right, the first point, though, the world hates Jesus. You and I are collateral damage. Now, the world hates us, too, but the Bible is very clear. It hates us because it hates him. It hates us because it hates him. Let's look at just, you don't have to go there, but John 15, 8. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Just driving this point home. Luke 6, blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast you out, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. I mean, uh, there's more than one person I know of that their family who is not saved has cast them out of their company. And it's a hard thing to, to, to imagine. It's a hard place to be in. Um, but again, if that's, if that's your position, this is for you. Um, if you're, if you're weighed down by this burden of sin, inadequacy, or the separation, perhaps, that rejection is the word we'll use. This is for you. The world hates God, and we are collateral damage. Matthew 10, 28. And ye shall, this is Jesus talking, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. This woman was hated, sure, but think about it. Did the Pharisees really want justice? Were they really concerned about, oh, she did wrong. We need, to, we need to condemn her. No, they said, I hate Jesus, and I'm here. The Bible is very clear. They used her to get to Jesus. Why am I saying this? Are you attacked by, your, by the accusers of this world, by the devil? I'm not, I'm not excusing sin. Not at all. Jesus doesn't either. That's a big misconception we'll hit on. He's not excusing sin. But if your accusers are there hitting you hard, just remember I know I've sinned in the past. I have been a sinner. I'm saved from that. And there's times when we got into Jesus is there as our mediator. It's the second point. And we got to say, hey, I know I've sinned. But you can't, be, you can't, you can't sideline me because of that. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for Christ. So the world hates us because it hates him. Notice what their hatred does, though. What, what the world's hatred, what the devil's hatred does, it doesn't play fair. I think that's no surprise. It doesn't play fair. Legally speaking, you got to ask, there's the woman, where's the man? He said, we caught her in the very act. So it stands very much to reason they caught the man in the very act. The Bible doesn't say, but it makes you wonder, was this a setup? It wasn't fair, was it? The, the law of Moses actually said both the man and the woman were to be stoned. It doesn't say just the woman. In fact, the, um, the standard of accusation was very strict. You had to have two witnesses. It wasn't enough to just see him coming out of the room. It was very strict. It was very rare to have this type of uh, prosecution. So it makes you think maybe it's a setup. And in short, it wasn't fair. The man should have been there. But they didn't care. Maybe it was one of them. Who knows? doesn't matter. They hated her because they hated Jesus. They weren't looking at the woman as a person at all. They were looking at her only as a thing, an instrument whereby they could formulate a charge against Jesus. Sometimes we're caught in the same position. Again, please don't misunderstand me. I am not excusing sin. and Jesus does not excuse sin. But the point of this is to encourage us to move forward, to move forward. She was trapped. Now, the other point is she wasn't fair, but... They try, the world and the devil will try to suffocate and immobilize you because of your sin, to crowd you in. That's their goal. She was immobilized. She was brought against her will, and she was set in the middle. Can you imagine that? you got men on all sides of you. You're standing there. They I, I mean, apparently they didn't let her sit down. She had to stand in the middle, a public place. It was embarrassing. She didn't have to technically be there for this. They could have, they could have just went to Jesus and made their petition to him, but they brought her. They put her there. She's crowded in. She's stuck. She can't move forward. It's her doom. She can't move. 
Okay? That's what the world wants to do with you and me. And please understand that. The world, we've all sinned, right? I mean, who here is going to say they haven't sinned? We've all sinned. We're all feeling inadequate at times. But the world's going to say, because you're inadequate, I'm going to capitalize on that, and I'm going to immobilize you to not move, to not go forward for Christ. Don't let that happen to you. We'll see the remedy for that in just a minute. If you're in sin, I'll touch, I'll touch on this. If you're in sin, currently, you need to be freed from that. And that goes without saying. But there's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 5, 22. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. I heard someone say it this way. It's a picture of someone sitting down in, the, in sin, right? And you're sitting there, and these cords of sin, as you sin, start wrapping you around. And they keep wrapping you around. And you get tighter and tighter, and there's more ropes until the point where you're stuck, right? That's the image that this Proverbs gives us. The cords of your sin will wrap you around. And then guess what? You are immobilized. How is God going to use you? So if you're in sin, you need to get freed of it. And I hope you understand the spirit in which I'm asking this. I know there are, there are those who would condemn in a way of, you're in sin, you need to just get out. And you do need to get out, but look how Jesus did it. We'll, t- we'll look at it later with this woman. He, he said, yeah, you have sinned. Don't do it anymore. But he had it with a spirit of love. You got to get out of it. And we're here to help you. Okay? So that's, that's that point. We'll move on from that. But if you are feeling, let's say, I've been there, right? I've sinned in the past. I've been freed of it. I've been forgiven of it. But you might have these feelings of, are you feeling crushed by outside pressures? Are you feeling inadequate? Do you feel the eyes of judgment cast upon you? Is the devil and or the world hammering you with accusations? If, that's, if any of that describes you, then this is for you. And I'll, let me just touch on the remedy. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to it uh, later on. But here's the remedy. Repent. Okay? Repent. We'll see that with what the woman did. Go. So repent. Go. Sin no more. Actually, the instructions are actually pretty easy. How you apply it, maybe that's another question. So anyway, the world hates us, right? But the world hates Jesus. And we're going to be some collateral damage too. Jesus is our mediator. We all know the verse, 1 Timothy, or it should be 2 Timothy 2.5. You know which one that is? I thought it was 2nd. I put 1 Timothy. Whatever. Look it up. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, Jesus, as our mediator, I mean, you don't want anyone else but Jesus. He was not shaken by the accusation. Did you find it? It's first. Man, why did I doubt myself? I'm inadequate. <laughs> Jesus isn't shaken. These accusers came. They, they, he's, what, 33 now, 32 years old, physically speaking. You got all these religious leaders there, much older and wiser. They're coming to him with this. Legal question in reality. Jesus, what are you going to do? Man, I'd be sweating bullets. I don't know about you. I hate interviews personally. I hate them. I cannot. Mm, you put me in an interview, you'll see a different person. I'm like, <laughs> it's a rain cloud sweat coming down. I hate it. Can't do it. This kind of feels like this situation. Like, what are you going to do? Jesus is super calm, as if he didn't hear. Our accusers are going to Jesus. You can't do it. You're coming to us. What are, you're inadequate. And our mediator is the one that just goes, and he stoops down. He starts writing, whatever he's writing. And he gets up, and he confronts our accusers with calmness and power. That's our mediator. That's our mediator, and it's awesome. She needs a mediator, and she has one in Jesus. Number three, we need to submit to Jesus as Lord. This is no surprise. This is no surprise. She called him. The only words she says, let's look at that actually. The only words she says um, are in verse 11. But verse 10, Jesus says to her, Woman, where are, thy, where are those thine accusers that no man condemn thee? And she said, no man, what? No man who? What did she say? Lord. What, have, what has everyone else called him at this point? Up in chapter 7 and, in, and earlier. Master. What's master mean? Teacher. Oh, hey, Teacher. There's no submission with that. Some said he was the Christ. Some said he was a deceiver. Some said he was a good man. Read chapter 7. Uh, read chapter 8. You'll see that. But she called him Lord. She submitted. There's some sense of repentance here. She had to repent. 
Jesus told her to sin no more. So it is a true act of repentance. You need to turn from your sin. Jesus recognized that this woman did in fact sin because he told her to stop doing it. That's the, that is an act of repentance. There's another part of this that I really love that I wanted to go back to, which is being alone with Jesus. When you uh, get to that point of repentance, and all the accusations and your accusers, even your own self, feeling inadequate, when all that gets drowned out in the background and it's just you and Jesus, that's the point of repentance. It's just you and him. There's plenty of people that are going to accuse you. There's the devil. He'll accuse you. But when it's just you and Jesus, it's different. Maybe he's asking us the same question today. Where are those thine accusers? And I mean, to put yourself in that, Andrew, with Jesus, Andrew, where, where are your accusers? There's more to that question. Jesus knows where they are. But he's almost making the point and highlighting it's me and you right now. And when we get to that point of repentance, it's just me and Jesus. Now, the other thing, and I want to clarify this too. Um, Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The Pharisees knew the thrill of co condemning people or condemnation. Jesus knew the thrill of forgiveness. Now, there is a misconception where some will say, oh, Jesus is, you know, this, the slang we use today where it goes, hey, no judgment here, right? I'm not judging you. Um, I've heard that applied to this, uh, this portion of Scripture. Farther from, farther, nothing could be farther from the truth, okay? He was not saying, oh, no judgment here. He, he actually said, go and sin no more. In other words, you're sinning, you've sinned, go fix it. And if I can make a note here, she, for all we know, it seems like she had just committed this act. She was currently an adulterous woman. She didn't have to get to a position where she felt adequate enough to be forgiven. So there's a lot of times, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I myself have been there, where it's like, I'm just, I'm just not adequate. I'm inadequate, and yeah, I can go to Jesus, but I'm just not adequate. It, we know you're not adequate enough. Go to Jesus today. If you're in this position, you can go today and get this settled. You don't need to get to a spot where you can finally be at a position where you can talk to Jesus about this, okay? But here's what condemnation, if you look at the context of the condemnation, let me just, let me just go through it here, actually. It'd be better to do it that way. It doesn't necessarily mean judging. Let me clarify that. Jesus is not giving his stamp of approval. He's not saying no judgment here. It's more of a sentencing. More of a sentencing. In fact, when he says, I don't condemn you, that should be no surprise to us. 1 Corinthians says, for, we, uh, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Oh, actually, no, hold on. This is not the right one. John 3, 17. Let me read that one. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus, we all knew this. He didn't come to condemn. He came to forgive. He came to save. Romans 8, there is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is no deviate, uh, deviation from his character. He's not here to condemn. He's here to forgive. I won't read all the verses, but there's a difference between this condemnation and, uh, and judgment in the sense that this con condemnation was more of a sentencing. There's a verse that says that they condemned Jesus to death. They sentenced him to death. Jesus is saying, no one sentenced you. I'm not sentencing you. In other words, I want to save you. I want to help you. I'm here to be your help. Go and sin no more. And that's that last point. We need to go. We need to go. She just got this word, these words from Jesus that says, I don't condemn you. Go and then sin no more. That's funny that comes after. I would have probably put it the other way. I would have said, hey, don't sin anymore and then go. In other words, get your life kind of right and then go. No, he's like, no, get up and go. So that's the point here today to everybody. When you step up off this chair, out of this chair, if you're in any part feeling inadequate, if you're in any part uh, feeling, you know what, I'm feeling sidelined like I was at that basketball game. I'm at the sidelines and I can't work for Jesus. If you're feeling that, no, 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 go. Repent, go. And while you're going, sin no more. Don't tell me you need to get to a spot where you feel like you can then go. Go right now. Joshua 1.9 actually is one of my favorite verses. Um, be not dismayed. Be strong, courageous. Don't be dismayed. Don't be broken down. You can go. The only application that I'll hit on today before we quit is what I've kind of already touched on. Are you able to give godly counsel to somebody? Are you in that position? Because 
sometimes I'm not in that position. And I know I've talked to a lot of people, and obviously won't name names, but they just say, I, I can't counsel anybody because I'm not there yet. You know, the Bible does say, study to show yourself approved. And maybe this is a challenge to all of us. Are you in the word daily to the point where God can say, hey, go to this person? Because people are hurting. People need help. And are you in a position where you can go and obey God's call? Or are you saying, having your head down and saying, I'm not adequate. I can't be a blessing to anyone else. I'm not good enough. We know you're not good enough. You know, I'm not good enough. Obey the Lord's calling. Talk to him today. Ask him to use you and be in that position where you're, you've been studied, you're studied up, and you can be used of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, your love for us. We thank you for how you've displayed yourself to us in your word, Lord, and how um, you want to use us despite us. And Lord, if there's anyone in here today who is feeling the weight of sin or inadequacy or even rejection, Lord, that they'd be alone with you, that they'd find themselves in the midst with just you and everything else drowned out. And Lord, to talk to you and Lord, that you would um, give them those marching orders to go, to go. Lord, we love you. We look forward to what you have for us today in your name. Amen.